What separates a good game from a revolutionary game? Is it raw creative power? Is it masterful game design? Is it amazing new technology? The answer, as you might expect, isn't necessarily any of these things. It's normally just good marketing. But good marketing is one of the many evils of the modern world, and it often results in misinformation being spread about which games invented what. You've probably all heard the story of Thomas Edison and Nikola Tesla, but gaming has many of its own Nikola Teslas, many of them so obscure that they barely get a stub on Wikipedia. Let me pose another question. Where did it all begin? Which games were the first in their respective genres? The games that started it all but got buried under heaps of imitators? And why is it that we don't remember those games? Over the next hour or so, I'm going to try and give the credit that these original video game pioneers deserve. The people who had the talent, the ingenuity and the creativity to look at mainframe computers and oscilloscopes and punch cards and think, hey, I bet I could play video games on this thing. Once I asked my dad what people in those days did for fun, and he said he played with matchbox cars, so I guess you can't really blame them. Yes, these games are crude, they're primitive, some of them aren't even well designed, but nevertheless, they're a fascinating and integral part of gaming history. These are the ideas that have been refined and reshaped into the familiar genres, cliches and tropes that we all love so dearly today. So, enough stalling. Let's dive into 5 Genre-Defining Games Forgotten by History. The Humble First Person Shooter Before I name the first FPS game ever made, I want to discuss some of the more recent additions to the genre and show how it's evolved over the years. As you know today, the FPS genre comprises around 96% of games being released, with an additional 3% being made up of survival and zombie related games. But things weren't always this way. In May 1992, a plucky young company by the name of id Software released Wolfenstein 3D, a game about shooting Nazis in the face with guns, which is very much cutting edge at the time. The company's name, id, was a reference to Freud's structural model of the psyche, with the id being responsible for the basic instinctual drives, and Wolfenstein provided that hedonistic pleasure in droves, provided you're into blowing up mechanically augmented Nazis. Wolfenstein 3D was released to massive success and critical acclaim. If it hadn't been for this game, we wouldn't have any of the fantastic first-person shooters we had 10 years ago. And in lieu of an official name for the genre, many gaming publications began referring to similar games as Wolfenstein clones and later Doom clones. Wolfenstein 3D gets a lot of credit for being an early FPS innovator, and it really did catapult the genre into the mainstream. But the truth is, it didn't invent the genre, nor did it invent the ray casting engine, nor did it invent digitized sound. In fact, it wasn't even the first Wolfenstein game. Castle Wolfenstein was originally a series of action adventure games for the Apple II, although nobody populating the many internet bulletin board systems of 1992 ever seemed to claim that Wolfenstein 3D had somehow dumbed down the series even though it probably had. In fact, Wolfenstein 3D wasn't even the first FPS game by John Carmack and co. Before founding id, the gang, Romero, the two Carmacks and Hole, had worked at a publishing company called Softdisk and made several games under that name, even after adopting the id software name for the release of Commander Keen. Late the previous year, they'd released Catacomb 3D, a game about a man with ghostly white hands who shoots monsters with magic fireballs. The game was mightily impressive for its time because, as far as I can tell, it was one of the first games that mapped textures onto the walls. Now, 3D games had been around for eons, but most of them either used flat shaded polygons or sometimes wireframes. Reportedly, John Carmack saw the use of texture mapping on a rather impressive Ultima Underworld demo at CES and remarked that he might be able to write a faster texture mapper himself. And by gum, he did! because he's John motherfucking Carmack, and he would later become a rocket scientist in his spare time. So yes, the existence of the Ultima demo means that 
texture map 3D had been done before Catacomb, and the game that did it first is arguably an amazing game in its own right. Although Carmack did 3D in a much more convincing fashion, and ended up releasing Catacomb 3D first, Ultima Underworld The Stygian Abyss can be considered the precursor to many of the finest first-person non-shooters of the 90s, including Elder Scrolls, System Shock, Deus Ex, Thief, and possibly even Kingsfield. It was directed by Richard Garriott, produced by Warren Spector, and designed by Paul Neuwirth, and it featured the familiar trappings of a dungeon crawler with a number of modern twists that made it stand out from the crowd. It had texture mapped walls, ceilings, and floors, and, much like Doom, it allowed for rooms to have different heights. Unlike Doom, it also supported inclined floors, and it let the player jump up and look up and down. It even had a basic physics system. Bear in mind, this game was released before Wolfenstein 3D. The design team for the game have stated that what they really wanted to make was a dungeon simulator, and the obsessive attention to detail evident throughout the game's design is proof enough of this claim. The gameplay of Stygian Abyss served as a boilerplate for many first-person RPG-style games throughout the 90s and even through to the modern day. If not for Stygian Abyss, we almost certainly wouldn't have Namco's highly successful Souls series. It should be noted, however, that the technological complexity of the game resulted in it running very poorly on contemporary IBM PCs, despite the small graphical viewport and draw distance. So, to reiterate, Carmack did it better. What can I say? Carmack's the man. Uh, back to shooters. At some point, I'm going to have to stop fawning over id software, but before I do, I should talk about the FPS that the studio cut their teeth on, Hover Tank 3D. Again, it's a raycasting game, again, John Carmack programmed it, again it was published by Softdisk, this time in April 1991, six months before Catacomb 3D. Hover Tank was a first-person vehicular combat game, with pretty badass smooth 3D gameplay and those trademark late 80s digitized sound effects. Seriously, look at the videos, the hostages, they seem so damn unenthusiastic about being rescued. <laughs> At the risk of sounding pretentious, Hover Tank's 3D's deep and multi-layered characters compellingly contextualize the rest of the experience. <laughs> I got something in my throat. Sorry. I'll be honest. I've got nothing interesting or insightful to say about this game. Uh, so I figure I should clarify what I mean when I say ray casting. How games like Hover Tank drew graphics on the screen and why it's so cool. So here's what ray casting isn't. It's not 3D, it's fake 3D. But when done well, it's really hard to distinguish it from the real thing. And the fact that it isn't real 3D is really the reason that ray casting works. The more expensive calculations involved don't have to be done for every pixel on the screen. Rather, they're done for every vertical line of pixels that appears. So say you've got a screen that's 320 by 240 pixels in size, with ray casting, you only have to do 2D vector math. And because you're only doing calculations for every vertical column of pixels, you'd only be doing it 320 times a frame, rather than 320 times 240 times. Take your average Wolfenstein 3D map. As you can see from the editor, it's a strictly 2D affair. It's basically just a maze viewed from above. So let's say that this dot represents the player, and the red lines represent the player's field of view. Here's what happens in your average frame. The engine will send out a ray that starts the player and continues until it reaches the wall. The leftmost red line, in this case, would represent the leftmost column of pixels on the user's screen. For each ray, the computer checks every so often along the ray to see if it's collided with the level geometry. Once it does, the engine recalls this distance and draws a wall. The farther away the wall was, the smaller the engine will draw it. If you're working with a grid, like you did in Wolfenstein, you can make the algorithm very efficient because you can make it so that it only checks for the presence of a wall at grid lines. Every frame, a bunch of rays, 240 of them, get cast out from the player, hit the level geometry and draw the level on the screen. From here, it's a fairly trivial bit of vector math to move and rotate the player's field of view about. And that's really all there is to it. Not only do you only have to do 240 of these calculations every frame, but it's not too prohibitively expensive to draw stuff that's farther away from the player. You can easily get away with doing it on a 286 with minimal slowdown. Or at least Carmack did. Because he's John motherfucking Carmack. He also doesn't age. Of course, JC eventually expanded this concept to include both texture mapping and floors with arbitrary heights, but I'm a shitty programmer, so I won't talk about these. 
Hover Tank was probably the fastest and most playable raycasting game to have been released at that time, although there were other implementations of raycasting floating about before that. It gets a bit muddy, but the earliest game I can find to use it is a weirdly obscure thing called Midi Maze. It's probably better known as Faceball 2000, its Game Boy re-release. It was released for the Atari ST in 1987 by Hybrid Arts. Unfortunately, I don't have much to say about the gameplay. You wander around a maze, you shoot faces with balls. I suppose this would be where the game gets its name. It seems like more of a tech demo than an actual game. However, Midi Maze is a unique thing. Raycasting had been documented in scientific papers for a while because engineers were interested in its applications for computer-aided design, but Faceball was the first game that decided to use the technique. It's also the first game that had deathmatch multiplayer via the Atari ST's MIDI in and MIDI out ports, of course. Computer networks were a little more primitive back then. To get a 16-player deathmatch, you would literally have to daisy-chain 16 computers together. You literally you plug them in in a loop. For some reason, I find that quite twee. Back in the day, I don't think anybody actually bothered hooking up their 16 Atari STs together to play this game, but it's definitely more than just a curiosity. In celebration of Midi Maze's amazing technology, tournaments of it are held yearly at a gaming convention in Minnesota called Con of the North. Even more amazing, the 16-player multiplayer carried over to the Game Boy port. It's the only Game Boy game to support simultaneous 16-player multiplayer, probably for good reason. I mean, think about it, 16 Game Boys, all those link cables, a dog or small child could easily get strangled in there. <clears throat> okay, so we nailed it down. Mini May started raycasting, it started deathmatch multiplayer, and it almost definitely started shooting, right? Wrong. As utterly, utterly perplexing as it sounds, FPS did not start with Midi Maze. In fact, it didn't even start in the 80s. The very first FPS game was released in 1974. That is a date closer to the start of the Second World War than the present day. That literally blows my mind. Maze War is an imaginatively titled first-person shooter made by Steve Colley, initially for the Ilmac PDS-1 minicomputer. Uh, very little footage of the game exists, even though it was released for many different systems. Uh, the footage you're seeing here is a combination of the Mac version and the Xerox Star version. Now, Maze War isn't too complex. All the action takes place on a grid, and the game overlays 2D sprites on the screen, showing the grid-based level geometry. It's a really cheap way of faking 3D, and it was actually still in use all the way up to the mid-90s. Nevertheless, it really is a first-person game, and it's really a first-person shooter, too. The aim of the game is to run around the maze and gain points by shooting your opponent, who looks like an eye for some reason. That's not all, though. Maze War actually has a laundry list of firsts, which I can rattle off. It was the first game to contain a minimap in addition to the main screen. It was the first game to have a level editor of some sort. It was the first game with any kind of network play, although it wasn't as sophisticated as Midi Maze. Only two computers could play peer-to-peer. -peer. It was even the first game with internet play, with a later port of the game coming online in 1986, in an age when TCP IP was new and internet access was mostly limited to scientific organizations. Maze War has been worked on by so many people and companies over the years that it's impossible to give credit to all of them. But who knows where we would be without it? Perhaps we would have instated world peace, eliminated all suffering, and be in the process of colonizing Mars. It's impossible to tell. Speaking of Mars, Steve Colley, Maze War's original author, went on to work for NASA on the technology behind early versions of the Mars rover. So that's two, um, that's two early FPS people who just love space. So next time you sit down and you play your Call of Duties or Halos or whatever's popular right now, remember, FPS games are older than you might think. Ah, 3D platformers. The humble 3D platformer. Rest in peace. The genre may be comatose today, but back in the late 90s we were tripping over the goddamn things, and every video game mascot seemed to have at least five, and a kart racer for good measure. Approaching sound barrier! But of course, we all know where this trend started. 
it started with a single game. A game so breathtakingly original that it defined an entire genre. A game so good that it's still, even in the futuristic year 2014, it's still the benchmark for a great 3D platforming experience. A game that will be loved and remembered for literally decades to come. I am of course talking about the one and only Bubsy 3D. I know this game extremely well, but in order for it to even start, I need to get to the area. While I'm getting there, I'm collecting some junk along the way, uh, bopping a few enemies, hopping these platforms, and I think you got the idea. Exciting, isn't it? Some other similar game came out around the same time, but did it get the Gold X Award from PS Extreme? Probably not, because they don't exist. The fifth generation of game consoles marked the first time that video games could really feature detailed, engrossing 3D worlds. Now, 3D had been experimented with before, but consoles lacked the power to push out the kind of worlds that people really wanted to explore, so consoles tended to stick to on-rails type games like Star Fox or terrible ports of Doom. Home computers, however, were a whole different kettle of fish. In the early 90s, gaming on home computers was only just coming alive, at least in America, thanks to breakthrough technology from various folks I've already discussed. And the situation then was very much the same as it is now. On home computers, your game didn't have to be limited by current console hardware, it didn't have to have mass market appeal, in fact, it didn't even have to be good. And this is Alpha Waves, a game published by Infograms in the year 1990, the same year as Apogee published Commander Keen. Alpha Waves was an odd, abstract kind of game. People seem to think that this aesthetic is a modern thing brought on by arty farty indie developers who live in San Francisco and smoke three whole marijuanas a day, but actually, it's been going strong for decades. The game is broken into two modes, action and emotion. I like my games with both action and emotion, but I chose the top one, hoping for a visceral cinematic experience. Oh, how foolish I was. Alpha Waves is a literal platform game. You play as an assortment of polygons, and you get dropped into a series of cubes with platforms suspended in the air, and you bounce around all willy-nilly trying to reach different areas of the map. The rooms are called things like Plentitude and Globulul. There are springs that bounce you up higher, and balloons you can burst that make you float or something, but I really don't know, this game confuses the hell out of me. My favourite thing about Alpha Waves is actually the sound it makes when you hit the floor. So satisfying. So satisfying. In fact, there's something delightfully soothing about the whole game. The delightfully nostalgic sound blaster music, perhaps or the game's charming use of colour and shape, which, despite the dated 3D, is still immensely appealing. The gameplay, however, is arse. Oh, it really is. You see, because nobody had really done platforming games before then, nobody really knew how to make them fun, or to how, to, how to make them at all, really. To start, tank controls. Tank controls were never fun. They weren't fun in Alpha Waves, they weren't fun in Croc, they weren't... Well, okay, maybe they were fun in Tank Racer, but that's beside the point. In a game where mobility is so important, you feel like you barely have the tools needed to navigate the levels at a reasonable pace. Additionally, the levels are all identical cubes, save for colour, that are dotted with a series of floating platforms barely bigger than your character itself. It adds together to create a frustrating, repetitive game that no one would ever want to play. Nevertheless, Alpha Waves deserves some brownie points. It's a technical marvel, for one. It was released in a year when this was considered graphically impressive on the PC. This was an era when operations like multiplication were considered too expensive to do a lot. The Motorola 6800, on which the original Atari ST version of the game ran, didn't even have the capacity to do floating point math at any reasonable speed. I am dead serious. You're looking at a 3D game rendered entirely without cosines. I can't even comprehend how that works. Now, I won't waffle too much more in this video, but if you're interested in Alpha Waves, I've included a link to a post-mortem of the game by one of the programmers in the description of this video. Have a little looky. It's worth it. But was Alpha Waves the first platform game? Well, probably. But when am I going to get another opportunity to talk about iRobot? Okay, I will set the scene for iRobot. 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 
There's an eye and a robot. The eye is Big Brother, that's not even the right novel. The eye sits atop a pyramid and shoots lasers at things it finds personally offensive. You play a quirky sort of underdog robot with no legs who seeks to oppose the pyramid eye's oppressive rule because the pyramid hates jumping and thinks it should be punishable by death. Do you have any idea how much I love jumping? Can you imagine that? Anyway, <clears throat> anyway, <clears throat> here we are. A dystopian jumping thriller. The aim is to run along every floor tile, shooting lasers and thus destroying the eye and the shield. Uh, during this, you're menaced not only by the eye, but by birds, big rocks and flying sharks, the natural enemy of the robot. The pyramid will destroy you if it catches you subverting its strict no jumping rule. Yeah, even by 80s arcade standards, this game is hella weird. It's a bit of a stretch to call it a platformer. While jumping between platforms is a big focus of the game, the jumping is all done automatically, Zelda style. It probably has more in common with games like Qbert and Pac-Man, but to say that the game didn't at least influence later 3D platformers would be an outright lie. The on-rails camera perspective is actually extremely reminiscent of the camera used in the Crash Bandicoot games. iRobot was released in 1983, making it not only one of the first 3D platforming games, but one of the first polygonal 3D games full stop. And yet, unlike Alpha Waves, it's still fun to play, even to this day. It's quirky and original, and it has that bizarre charm that you can only find in 80s arcade games. Which makes it even more surprising that when released, the game was a massive flop. Not only was it panned by critics and disliked by audiences, but only around a thousand iRobot machines were ever produced, making it a rare and highly sought after collector's item today. I think iRobot was probably too ahead of its time. It's only recently that people have begun to look back at it and go, hey, you know what? People in 1983 were wrong. Which really should be obvious. Hi, my name's Monroe. Uh, you've probably already noticed that I have incredibly blue eyes. Hi, my name is Phil. Uh, most of my friends call me Big Phil. Hi, Mom. The Humble Horror Game Once, when I was a child, I went to my friend's house, and we played Amiga. I love Amiga, but man did it take a long time to load. I'm glad society has moved beyond magnetic tape as a storage medium. Anyway, long story short, we went and played in the creepy woods outside his house and we saw a noose and a bird scare went off and it got dark and I got scared and after I got home, my parents couldn't coax me away from the safety of my computer for weeks. True story. Um... <clears throat> Now, I don't really know why human beings feel this, this mysterious force compelling them to scare both themselves and one another in entertaining ways, but for whatever reason, we all feel it. It must be instinctual. Everybody loves a good horror game. And for that reason, the horror genre has been around for longer than you might think. Now, let's start with the obvious, Resident Evil. I don't really think I need to talk about this game too much. It had zombies before we were all bored of them, jump scares, before we were all bored of them, good atmosphere, graphics that were pretty damn good for its time, note the use of pre-rendered backgrounds allowing them to spend all their polygons on characters, and hell, I didn't even hate the puzzles. Much. That was a lie, the puzzles were dumb. The game also popularized tank-like controls, which became a staple of the genre for many years to come. Although some view tank controls as cumbersome and dated, to an extent, they also helped focus the gameplay experience. Any kind of real combat or dexterity was out of the question with controls like that, and it forced developers to construct a truly horror-centric experience. Instead of a brawling game or a shooter, I'm looking at you, Dead Space. Hello, Dead Space! Can you hear me, Dead of course, the only reason I'm even bringing Resident Evil up is so that I can show you this clip. What is it? Blood. Jill, see if you can find any other clues. I'll be examining this. Hope this is not Chris's blood. Jill, here's a lockpick. It might be handy if you, the master of unlocking, take it with you. 
That was too close. You were almost a Jill sandwich. <laughs> You're right. Resident Evil is remembered as a horror pioneer because it was the first time anyone had really taken all these kinds of ideas and put them together and made a game that really resonated with people. But horror games as a whole are, of course, much, much older. Most people by now have at least heard of Alone in the Dark, thanks to that thing. We, we, but Alone in the Dark should be better known as the true perpetuator of survival horror as we know it today. You are Edward Carnaby, mustache turn of the century PI, or some woman if you really want, and you're called to investigate a suspicious suicide at a purportedly haunted mansion. From there, your standard survival horror game unfolds. You wander around the house, encountering polygonal zombies, living statues, death traps, pirates, tooth dogs, and yes, it even has a scene where a dog jumps through the window. Along the way, you'll find keys and weapons, and letters that tell you about some of the horrible events which occurred some moons ago. Oh, you find a lot of those, by the way. About half of the game seems to be reading letters. Anyway, oh, and there's hammy voice acting. They will find my body, but will not have my soul! Yes, so basically, Resident Evil is just a complete rip-off of this game. Um, Alone in the Dark, strangely enough, is yet another Infograms game, and it's yet another of the early 3D games, this one having been made in 1992, a mere two years after Alpha Waves, and a whole four years before Resident Evil. It was also designed by Frederick Grenal, who was the man responsible for porting Alpha Waves to DOS. I suppose you could say he was convinced that polygons would be the next big thing. Reynal wanted to try and replicate the feeling of old horror movies, the constant tension and the feeling of vulnerability and danger lurking around every corner, and he really nailed it. Even though the scares seem quite tame to a man who's been ruined by modern horror games, this game still manages to be tense and atmospheric. Alone in the Dark was not only a cornerstone of horror, but it featured a highly sophisticated animation system that essentially tweened a series of points floating in 3D space. Before Alone in the Dark, most 3D games had used static models or switched models on the fly, like frames of animation. However, this often resulted in choppy looking animation. For its time, this game was startlingly fluid and realistic. Alone in the Dark was a commercial and critical darling, and Infograms immediately wanted a sequel but Reynal was unhappy with the direction that the studio execs were taking and left the project, along with most of his team, to make games elsewhere. And it shows, because all the sequels are a massive pile of arse. What a shame. Now, this might surprise you, but there's actually another horror game that comes before Alone in the Dark. A long time before Alone in the Dark. Ten years before Alone in the Dark. In 1982. And this is going to sound crazy, but this game is actually more reminiscent of modern horror games than Alone in the Dark is. Have you heard of the Sinclair ZX81? If you're not European, the answer is probably not, but I'll explain it anyway, um, because I have a massive erection for computer hardware that's older than I am. Now, in the UK, home computers were massively popular during the 80s, from the primitive ZX81 to the later Commodore 64 and the cheaper BBC Micro. These were simple, relatively cheap computers that were designed to be programmable, and they inspired countless sweaty teenagers and adults alike all across the country to start building and selling their own homemade games. So, the ZX81 was this black thing with a truly abominable membrane keyboard, and you could program on it and you could load other programs via tapes. Uh, audio tapes, in fact, yes, actual audio tape. You plugged a cassette player into the computer and loaded your games from the tape. And in 1982, a 37 year old man from Portsmouth called Malcolm Evans programmed 3D Monster Maze. Watch and be amazed. Okay, so you'll notice it's very basic, a series of incredibly low resolution sprites stitched together in various ways to give the appearance of a blocky 3D environment a la Maze Wall. There's no sound and the monster, a Tyrannosaurus Rex, looks absolutely ridiculous. And what is that text moving along the bottom of the screen? What is this, a book video game? Everyone knows books are for nerds, golly. But look closely. 
Doesn't it bear a strong resemblance to modern games such as Amnesia The Dark Descent, or even Slender? It has all the elements. You're running around an unfamiliar, confusing environment, you have no way to defend yourself, you're being pursued by some kind of monster that you can only just escape from, and look again. ZX81 might not have been able to replicate bangs in the night or spooky monster noises, the subtle audio and visual cues that those games used to make you clench your buttocks, so instead, it resorts to scaring you with scrolling text at the bottom of the screen. He is hunting you. Rex lies in wait. Rex has seen you. Footsteps approaching. It's the exact same experience down to a T, and this was in 1982. I couldn't put it better than YouTube commenter Sharks445, who writes, LOL, 1982 Slenderman. He's like a modern day Rene Descartes. LOL indeed, Sharks445. In all seriousness, 3D Monster Maze was amazing. It was decades ahead of its time. And mad respect, Malcolm Evans and JK Grey Eye Software. Mad respect. The Humble Adventure Game. Let's talk about adventure games for a moment. What is an action adventure? We just don't know. It's some sort of vague umbrella term uh, for games with some amount of action, normally combat, mixed with exploration and the occasional bit of puzzle solving. So first, Ocarina of Time deserves some credit. To this day, it's still the template for pretty much every action adventure game ever. And to this day, it's still the originator of basically the only enemy lock-on targeting system that's worth a damn. It's a simple enough idea, hit the targeting button and your character moves in a circle around the enemy, always turning to face them, click the button and you switch to another enemy. But it's absolutely ingenious. To the best of my knowledge, no game before Zelda had this kind of targeting system. Many had lock-on targeting systems that were finicky at best and at worst, just plain broken. And there are games released today that are still suffering because their developers are apparently unable to keep up with gameplay advancements made by a game from 1998. Now, interestingly, a recent Iwata Asks revealed that the game's director, Toru Asawa, says that his team was inspired by watching some kind of live ninja show, wherein the main character was encircled by ninjas. However, the true roots of the action-adventure genre obviously go much, much deeper than Ocarina of Time to The Legend of Zelda, of course. 1987's sword-swinging Nintendo power-selling adventure game was a pivotal moment in the genre's history. It was one of the first games to have a huge, non-linear world that could be explored at the player's leisure, littered with secrets and things to do. Instead of telling the player what to do directly, the game would give gentle hints and nudges that shepherded the player in the right direction. Now, the legend goes, that it was inspired by Shigeru Miyamoto's childhood, but then there's another legend that Miyamoto threw a chair at someone when Nintendo snuck the Rosalina storybook into Mario Galaxy without him knowing, so uh, believe what you will, but it doesn't make the original Legend of Zelda any less amazing. Now, it's difficult to imagine a world in which gameplay like this didn't exist, but the simple fact is, before Zelda was released, it didn't. Nope, not a single game. No. Okay, well, technically speaking, there was one game. Hydlide. <laughs> now, Hydlide on the NES was one of the only games of its type not to have bank-switched memory. This means that it wasn't easy to load things in and out of memory as the game was running. As a consequence, NES Hydlide's entire world is 5x5 five five screens across, the music is a three-second long riff from Indiana Jones, and everything about the game is awful. Um, Hydlide was definitely the innovator. It's got most of the ingredients of Zelda to the point that Zelda could easily be called some sort of ripoff. But it's bad. It's so bad. Especially the NES version, which is the only one that non-Japanese gamers are familiar with. I'll skip over it for now, because it's got a fair bit of recognition online already, but interested parties are very much encouraged to go have a look at Virtual Hydlide for the Sega Saturn which many true hardcore gamers consider to be the Citizen Kane of Hydlide. 
back on topic, Zelda also sports the famous battery-backed save game. Again, games like Super Mario Bros. hadn't happened upon the idea of the player dropping their adventure to feed a baby or something, and picking it up again at a later date. It's worth noting that the original version of Dragon Quest, a game with similar ideas developed at roughly the same time, although released a few months later, used a password save system. Yeah, a password save system! In an RPG! That's just awful. Anyway, we're not done yet, because there is one series of games that features not once in this list, but twice, and that is Wolfenstein. You see, most people think that the Wolfenstein series started with Wolfenstein 3D, much like Final Fantasy started with 7, but no. Wolfenstein started all the way back in 1981 with the stealth action-adventure game Castle Wolfenstein for the Apple II. The game tasked you with busting out of the eponymous castle and navigating maze-like non-linear environments. The game is notable not only for its novel structure, but for the player's ability to kill guards and search their bodies for bullets, keys and other goodies. As well as being one of the early action-adventure games, it's quite possible that Castle Wolfenstein was the first stealth-based game ever made, even though you were technically able to shoot your way through every enemy and be on your merry way. The last game I want to talk about, and the originator of all this action-adventure nonsense, is none other than a game titled Adventure. Adventure was a graphical adaption of an earlier text-based game called Colossal Cave Adventure, made for the Atari 2600. The player, that's Square there, is a fellow looking for some sort of magic chalice, which is guarded by a bunch of dragons. Along the way, and this is the key part, the player is able to explore a large level at will, and is able to pick up items and use them to do stuff. For example, he can pick up a key and use it to unlock a door. A sword can be used to slay dragons, and somehow he can carry an entire bridge which he uses to traverse obstacles. Adventure was released in 1979 and went on to sell over a million copies. It was the first game in which the player had an inventory that they could manipulate without resorting to a text parser system, although it could only hold one item at a time. It was the first game that featured both adventurous exploration and visceral cinematic combat, and you might think that last sentence was a bit facetious, but it was, I'm sorry. Sadly, the video game world was a very different one back then to the one it is today. Atari's internal policy was that the game's designers and programmers were not named or credited whatsoever, within the game or otherwise. The game was property of Atari, and Atari alone. In fact, some discontented programmers eventually left Atari to produce their own third-party 2600 games and they founded Activision, the first third-party developer ever, and created a series of games, most notably Pitfall, something that Atari had never intended for. In fact, it could be argued that Atari's mismanagement of its own employees was a large part of what eventually killed the company, and even killed the game industry in the US. Although, that's a story for another time. In fact, I guess you could call it a pitfall of their game development strategy. Uh, I'm so bloody witty. So, the point is, how can I credit the man behind all of this? Well, all the game's creator wanted was a simple little credit in the game. And he was a clever bastard, so, by hook or by crook, got it. Have a look at this. The player is in the second level catacombs. There's actually an object here, a single pixel in size in the exact same colour as the background. If the player takes this object and brings it to this area here, and then walks through this previously solid wall... Aha, uh -huh, there is the author's credit. In putting this little secret in the game, Warren Robinette, who programmed the game, had created not only the first action-adventure game, but also the first video game easter egg. A feat that would only serve to get the video game industry into trouble 25 years later. Thanks, Warren. Thorin. The Humble Video Game What was the first video game? The simple answer is... I don't know. It depends what you define as a video game, really, and once you get as far back as early video games, the kinds of games that had mechanical moving parts in them, it all gets a bit ambiguous. Let's start with Pong. Who hasn't heard of Pong? I don't really need to explain this one. Pong, from Atari, released in 1972, was everything you could ever want from a video game. And by 
everything you could ever want from a video game, I mean a wood-panelled arcade machine. Pong was a huge success, both for humans and for pigs. It became the first commercially successful video game, shifting thousands of arcade machines and hundreds of thousands of home Pong consoles in 1975, three years later. And boy, Pong was copied. Boy was it ever copied. There was a continuum of Pong consoles that lasted for years and, for whatever reason, people just couldn't get enough of Pong. Or wood panelling, for that matter. But there was one Pong console that wasn't a ripoff, a series in fact, made by a company called Magnavox, and that's because Pong itself wasn't just a spin on an existing idea, it's a total and utter carbon copy of this thing. The Magnavox Odyssey, released in 1972, was the world's first home game console, and although the Odyssey is a lot less well known, it was better than Pong in a lot of ways. For one, it had interchangeable cartridges, with different games on them. They didn't have titles though, they just had numbers. Um, I can't help think but these cartridges look like knit combs. Originally it was going to have all the games built in, the addition of a cartridge system was actually a cost cutting method. People just got attached to them I suppose. In most regards, the Odyssey was a pretty basic thing. For one, the only graphics it drew were white dots. Any other graphics actually came from coloured overlays that you stuck on top of your TV screen like a jerk. Uh, there was no sound of any kind. The Pong game didn't even keep score. You got little cards with it and you were supposed to write down the score. In fact, I suppose most of the games were just board games with a pointer on the screen. But nevertheless, the Odyssey was a true pioneer cartridge-based game in 72, this was 13 years before the NES, and 5 years before the Atari 2600. It was quite astounding, even if the game designers hadn't quite grasped the idea of a video game. Unfortunately, the Odyssey was a sales failure. First, it was marketed in a way that made people assume it would only run on Magnavox branded TVs. And secondly, it wasn't sold by third-party retailers, only by Magnavox dealer stores. But it isn't all bad news. Magnavox sued Atari in 1974 for infringing on their intellectual property. Atari settled out of court, but from what I've heard, Magnavox got a big wadge of money and royalties on Pong consoles sold thereafter. It didn't help Atari's case that Nolan Bushnell, who became president of the company, had signed his name in a guest book, indicating that he'd played the Odyssey's ping pong game some years earlier. So that's the Odyssey the first game console with interchangeable cartridges that you could play on your TV. Now, it's not the first video game, I'm sure we're all used to that by now. Now, it all gets a bit muddy from here, I'm afraid. Nobody really knows what the first video game is, because your traditional definitions of video games stop making sense after a while. For example, what if the game is more mechanical than computerized? But I will do my best to draw a line in the sand. Here's a few contenders for what some people consider to be the first game. So this is the PDP-1. Now although you wouldn't know it by looking at it, it is a mini computer. It had the equivalent of 9216 bytes of RAM and a clock speed of 200 kilohertz, although it effectively functioned at only half of that. The RAM is stored on something called a magnetic core, which is basically an array of donut shaped magnets that functioned as bits. The PDP-1 contains 2,700 transistors. This computer loaded programs from paper. My generation only has a vague idea of what that even is. The computer, produced in 1959 by a team at MIT led by Ben Gurley, claims many remarkable achievements, including the first text editor and the first word processor. Bear in mind it claims them, although actually determining what is the first text editor is almost as convoluted as video games. But best of all, it claimed one of the first completely computerized video games, Space War. The man sitting next to the computer is Steve Russell, Space War's creator. Space War isn't a complex game, you have two ships, orbiting around a star, who have to shoot each other until there is only one ship. It almost seems old hat now. Earlier computers produced at MIT had also been capable of playing simple games like Tic-Tac-Toe. Earlier, in 1958, the American physicist William Higginbotham had created Tennis for Two, which was a purely analogue affair that played out a 2D tennis-like game on a modified oscilloscope. The game was a hit 
at his university's annual exhibition, but poor old Higginbotham was a serious physicist who really wanted to be remembered for his work on nuclear non-proliferation. If you dig a little deeper, it turns out that Higginbotham was part of a team that developed electronics for the world's first nuclear bomb. Man, I bet he regrets that one. You know, it's post-World War II America, the world is constantly under looming threat of nuclear extinction, he feels like he's partially responsible and you must do something about the whole affair, but his entire Wikipedia page is just about this one stupid tennis game that he made, reducing the entire rest of his career to a mere footnote. I guess gamers really do ruin everything. Uh, going back a bit further to 1952, we have OXO, the first computer game to have proper graphics. It was developed by Alexander Douglas for the EDSAC computer as part of his PhD thesis at the University of Cambridge. Amusingly, the game's input device was a rotary telephone. I think Mad Cats produced it, although that might be a humorous lie or wisecrack about Mad Cats controllers being poorly designed. Before then, there was a computer that played NIM, called Nimrod, built by the UK engineering firm Ferranti. It weighed about as much as a small car, and was the first game based on any kind of recognisable computer. This one filled with real, huge valves, none of your pansy-ass microchips. Even Alan Turing and co had a crack at writing a programme to play chess back in the day, although they never got a whole game working. Now, I could easily ramble for 30 minutes about every single pre-70s attempt at a video game, but this video has already gone on for far too long, so I'll cut to the chase. The earliest game that I can find any documented reference to is a thing called the Cathode Ray Amusement Device from 1947. It was apparently inspired by World War II radar displays. A patent was filed by physicists Thomas J. Goldsmith Jr. and Essel Ray Mann in January of that year. It was a pretty simple piece of equipment, 100% mechanical, no circuits, no programs. Just good, old-fashioned electrons. Now, from what I understand, it worked something like this. You had an anode and a cathode. You put an accelerating voltage between them. This means that electrons will be picked up from the cathode and flung towards the anode. If you throw a fluorescent screen into the mix, then the beam of electrons will hit the screen instead and cause it to light up where they hit. The machine was really quite simple. It contained deflection plates that held a charge, which would move about periodically and alter the path of the electron beam, meaning that the dot on the oscilloscope screen would move about. There were two knobs on the machine used to move the cathode and anode, and hence give the user some control over the dot's position as well. The aim of the game was simply to line up the dot with some crosshairs painted on the display. Cleverly, it was designed such that when the cursor lined up, a relay switch was triggered, which deliberately overloaded a resistor and caused an excess of current to flow through the circuit. Electrons went everywhere, which made the image go blurry, simulating the look of an explosion. As was usual for these early devices, players were expected to keep their own score, which makes them almost as pointless as golf. Unfortunately, all I can really do is stare longingly at this patent. There is no known working version of this device in existence. It was never released commercially because it was prohibitively expensive to make, and there are no videos of it in action. In fact, this document is so incomprehensible, I'm pretty much just mindlessly speculating on how it works. Nevertheless, it's largely agreed that the cathode ray amusement device is the first electronic gaming machine. It's got a display, it's got controls, and it's got a way to win. So, who am I to disagree? And that's it. That is the first game. And this is the end of our story. I'm sorry if this seems like something of an anti-climax, but that's how it is. The first video game is either a somewhat unimpressive and non-existent piece of technology, or possibly a one-ton NIM machine, depending on your definition. And is that really so surprising? These origin stories are never really that glamorous. And as crude as these machines were, they helped birth a multi-billion dollar entertainment industry that is, today, ruining our collective lives and rotting our children's brains. So, what do we learn? Well, some people are so passionately driven by their ideas that they're absolutely determined to see them realized and end up creating something genuinely revolutionary. Others might have throwaway thoughts and never come to realize their significance, or even live in an age when their innovations are considered commonplace. But regardless, 
video games have been an important part of the technological revolution that has shaped our lives over the past 100 years, and we have these people to thank, or perhaps curse. So next time you sit down to play Call of Halo or Angry Birds Instagram, remember whose work it is that they are undeniably building on. I think Sir Isaac Newton said it best. He said, if I have seen further, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants. In fact, he kind of lifted that soundbite from a 12th century French philosopher called Bernard of Chartres. Thank you for watching, and sorry for the long wait. In the meantime, if you're interested in the other stuff I make, you can find me writing for gatheryourparty.com and streaming games and making podcasts over at my website, lunchtime.org.uk. So if you'd like to chat or see any of the things I've made, then go there. Thank you for watching, and now here's some music. <laughs>